Well, Jehovah's Witnesses tell this programme how leaving their faith has left them isolated, shunned from friends and family, and on occasion even feeling suicidal. Jehovah's Witnesses are members of a Christian-based religious movement. There are about 6.9 million active witnesses in the world and about 130,000 or so here in the UK. Members reject the sinful values of the secular world and try to maintain a degree of separation from non-believers. They don't celebrate Christmas or Easter, discourage university education and don't vote. A viewer emailed us to say her son has refused to speak to her or let her see her grandchildren since she decided to stop being a Jehovah's Witness six years ago. She asked us to look into the practice of shunning, whereby people are ignored by their family and people in their former congregation when they choose to leave the faith. Speaking publicly for the first time together, three former Jehovah's Witnesses have given us a rare insight into what happens when you stop believing in the religion. One of them is Terry O'Sullivan, who stopped being a Jehovah's Witness 17 years ago. Sarah and John left much more recently, and we've protected their identities. These are not their real names, and John's words are spoken for him. Give us a little bit, give our audience a little bit of an insight into what it was like growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, Sarah. Um, I was what was classed as a third generation Jehovah's Witness. So my grandparents were Jehovah's Witnesses, my parents were Jehovah's Witnesses, and then I was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I was limited in my social groups, so I wasn't allowed to associate with school friends, but even then as I got older, be it living under my parents' roof or with my husband, I wasn't allowed to associate with work friends outside of work either. Right. So um, anybody who wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, effectively, yeah. you weren't supposed to be friends with or associate with? Exactly. Why? Um, they believed that bad associations, or the scripture they use is bad association spoil, spoils useful habits. Um, so anybody outside of the Jehovah's Witness religion mm. is classed as a bad association. That is friends and even family that aren't Jehovah's Witnesses that have maybe perhaps not converted at the, the same time. You're not supposed to have anything to do with them okay. either. What about yourself, John? What, what insight would you give our audience in terms of living your life as a Jehovah's Witness? What, you, what could you do, what couldn't you do, etc.? Well, there was nothing like birthdays or Christmases, any of that kind of normal celebrations that children seem to enjoy. They were strictly taboo, and that kind of subjected you to a fair bit of jeering and laughing at school. And then the kids would always say things like, what are you waiting for, Christmas? Just that kind of mickey-taking. Um, like Sarah, I didn't have many friends. I, I did have a couple of friends within school, but association with them was very limited, certainly outside. So most of my friends were Jehovah's Witnesses, which kind of makes you grow up in a very insular environment where the only thing you're ever subjected to is other witnesses and other witnesses kind of beliefs. And in terms of going to school, obviously you went to school. What about higher education, A-levels, university, Etc. Strictly frowned upon. Um, I got fairly good GCSE results at school. Um, I had the opportunity to go to university, but it was frowned upon. Because? Um, they encourage you to live a simple, what they call a simple life. Um, so you're not to be materialistic. So um, a higher qualification um, is classed as being materialistic. I was encouraged at 16 to get an admin job. Um, and Pioneer, uh, which is doing a set amount of hours for the um, witnesses going door to door. Um, I was really discouraged from, from doing any, anything, even my A-levels. Right. Certainly the education in my was uh, something that I felt very frustrated about because actually my dad was quite progressive in that he did encourage me to get an education, but the cultural environment of the witnesses was stronger than he was. So you, you went to school till what, 16? I went to school until I was 16, yeah. And then, as a lot of young witnesses do, I had to start window cleaning and did that for seven years, so I missed out on the opportunity to go to university, which is that's something I regret. And what insight would you give Terry in terms of being brought up as a Jehovah's Witness? Um, just what it was like. Um, yeah, so it's a very um, busy life. 
big a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, certainly when I was a, a witness, there were three meetings a week. John, you've been having doubts about being a Jehovah's Witness for many years. What sort of doubts? They were very creeping doubts, um, little things. Uh, I had a lot of question marks about some of the teachings that witnesses believe in, such as their belief about 1914 or the 144,000. What, you, you need to explain the 144,000? Yeah, the witnesses believe that only a very small amount of people will go to heaven and the rest of people um, that survive through Armageddon will go on to live on earth forever. And they take scripture from Revelation to believe that the, the number that will go to heaven will be limited to 144,000 people. But my own personal reading of the Bible, I, I wasn't convinced by that. And also a lot of the scriptures I would read would kind of indicate that that heavenly life wasn't for everybody. And, and did you voice those doubts to other members? Uh, not massively. A little bit. I would talk mostly to my wife about it or members of my family and progressively I would do more and more Bible reading myself and I would kind of, they tend to like read a scripture and marry it up with another scripture but I would read the whole chapter or several chapters and then think actually this doesn't seem to be saying exactly what they say it does. What did you fear would happen if you stopped being a Jehovah's Witness? Well I didn't really know what else to go to, you, you know, it's quite a frightening thought to believe that what you've been brought up with from a kid and you completely believe might not be true. So you tend to kind of uh, mentally block it out. A friend of yours, I think John, was also a Jehovah's Witness, died. How did that influence how you felt about your religion? Well, by that time I was already more and more convinced that what the witnesses taught wasn't true, or not all of it anyway. And then he he needed a, a blood transfusion and he got very ill. It took him a couple of weeks and he died and it just seemed like a sort of waste of life. He was, he was, a, he was a great guy and, and... And your religion, just to explain, your religion says that blood, tra blood transfusions aren't allowed? Yes, they use a scripture in Acts chapter 15 which says to keep abstaining from blood. Again, reading through the chapter I couldn't see any particularly good reason why that should mean someone should have to lay their life down. Again on that subject Jehovah's Witnesses in Britain told us when we have health problems we go to doctors who have skill in providing medical and surgical care without blood. Surgeons regularly perform such complex procedures as heart operations, orthopaedic surgery and organ transplants without the use of blood transfusions. You were disfellowshipped. Explain what that means. I, um, I, I got a call one day from elders. Well, previously they would come around to my house and they would say, what's the problem? Why don't you like going to the meetings anymore? And we would discuss it in points. But then I uh, had a call one day and they asked me to come to the hall where they worship to have what they call a judicial committee, which is essentially three elders and at least two witnesses to your alleged crime and they said it was to discuss my alleged apostasy. Well, by that time, I was pretty much convinced that the witnesses weren't the right to religion to inform me, so I said, I don't want to go. I really don't recognise your authority, and, and so they went ahead and had this judicial committee in my absence, and I had a phone call to say that I'd been disfellowshipped, and I had one week to appeal. Which means what kicked out? It essentially means everybody that you know within the witness organization, all your friends or your family, from that point onwards, they make an announcement in the Kingdom Hall, is from that point not allowed to speak to you at all. They're not allowed to speak to you? No. And that's happened? That has happened, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very sad, you know. I've, I've got several brothers and sisters, for instance, who I was quite close to, and from the day of my disfellowship, I haven't spoke to them at all. Which was how long ago? Uh, just over two years ago now. And what do you think about that? I, um, I think it's really sad. Mm. Have you tried to contact them? Yeah, sometimes I send them a message saying, I love you, thinking of you, but usually there's not a response. I did actually get a message from my brother saying, yeah, I love you too, but that's the strength of it. Right. And Sarah, this has happened to you too. You, you also have been shunned. Yes. Um, 
I don't speak to any of my family. Um, Mum, dad, siblings? No, not at all. Um, for how long now? For just over 18 months now. Um, that is really hard, isn't it? It is. I, much like John, I will try and send the occasional message. Um, but there's there's no response. Mm. Um, and the impact on you of that? It's been very, very difficult. Um, I actually get married in a couple of years' time and having to plan a wedding where your parents won't attend, um, where I will actually have no family um, on my side as I walk down the aisle um, because of a, a religious belief, because I left the religion on the basis of my my own safety, but because they classed it as being wrong in the Bible, mm. I I would class myself as an orphan, which is, is quite sad. Terry, how do your experiences compare, 17 years ago, yeah. compare to what John and Sarah have described more recently of being shunned? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't actually disfellowshipped like they were, um, so I managed to leave without getting, um, uh, as far as they were aware, breaking any of their rules. Mm. So I didn't have a judicial committee, so I managed, and I moved away as well. So, but the thing is, they still shun you anyway. So officially, they don't have to shun me, um, but they do. So what would happen if I was um, in, in the town where I grew up and I saw a witness, they would cross the street. Um, no, they wouldn't wave, you know, and this is people you grew up with as a child, you've been on holiday with them, these were your best friends, uh, and like I said, we didn't have friends outside of the religion. So you would be, see them every week and, you know, go, spend time around their house, they'd be at your house, that sort of thing. And then they won't even say hello, they'll cross the street now. Um, I'm sure you guys have had that experience plenty of times as mm. well. It's just a very common experience um, for ex witnesses. And so the impacts on you? Yeah, so um, um, obviously like one of my sisters um, who's still in the religion, um, I have no contact with her and she has two children who one's just leaving school and one I guess is at high school now and I don't know them. But I also don't know my sister because she was disfellowshipped when I was a child. She's older than me. And for five years, um, when she was trying to get reinstated, she would sit at the back of the Kingdom Hall. So when they want to come back to the religion, they have to sit at the back of the Kingdom Hall for each meeting. But you still can't talk to them. And that went on for sort of five years. Um, and um, yeah, so that was all of my children. And then when she got reinstated, mm -hmm. I left. So um, I don't really know my sister. I don't, I don't know what kind of food she likes. I don't know what she does at the weekend. Mm. You know, I don't know what she does for fun. Mm. So that's, knowing that you have a sister that you don't know, that's yeah. quite tough. Yeah, that is sad. Yeah. yeah. Sarah, did you know that you would be shunned effectively if you, if you didn't submit to the way your husband wanted to treat you? Um, yes. But you, you have a, a hope, I suppose, mm. that your family would still love you enough to speak to you. Um, but that, is, that was a driving point that made me stay probably longer than I should have because I was terrified I had no support network outside of the religion. Um, I, I had nobody, mm -hmm. I, if, and I knew if I, I left, I'd, I'd have nobody. So it was what was the lesser of, of two evils. And when you did leave, when you were shunned, disfellowshipped, where did you go? Where did you sleep? Um, I went from bed to bed at friends' houses, mm -hmm. from work, that I'd, I'd not known two minutes. And these people rally round me, these people that I'd been told were were awful and were bad association and God was going to smite them all at Armageddon. 
and yet these people opened up their homes. Um, all the, my colleagues in my office at the time, um, I stayed there and everybody made sure that I, I was all right and I was safe. John, where did you go? Because you wouldn't have friends or a support network outside the religion either, would you? No, um, it was a very isolating time. I mean, immediately after the disfellowshipping, I was still within my family home. Um, for uh, it, it turned out that it was my wife was one of the witnesses that in the judicial committee that put a huge strain on our relationship. So we ended up splitting. For a while, I lived in a tent, and then I lived in a caravan. So you were homeless, pretty much. Effectively. Yeah, I mean, it, it was kind of on my own doing because I chose to leave, but uh, I just felt I couldn't stay in that environment anymore. Um, it was a difficult time. I mean, that summer was probably the hardest time of my life. Didn't have anybody at all. I felt quite suicidal, to be honest. Did you? And now? Now I have been very lucky. I've got, uh, I have a fantastic support network of people that really care about me and really give me everything I need and I feel quite blessed. How do you reflect, Sarah, on your life as a Jehovah's Witness compared to now? I won't sit here and say it was all bad because you find good people and bad people everywhere. And there were good people, or there are good people in the religion that genuinely think that they're saving people's life and that they're doing the right thing. Um, but I look back and I think, who could have I been? What could have I been? Where could have I gone? If I had had the opportunities that people normally have, mm. um, what type of person would have I I've been. I mean, I'm, I'm more than trying to make up for it now with Christmas and birthdays and, and things like that, but I look back with some happy memories because they were the last memories I had with, with my family and, and with my siblings. Mm -hmm. But then I do have to look back and, and feel a lot of heartbreak that I'm never going to really ever be able to sit down for a Sunday meal with them again or, or when they, they die, I probably won't be invited to the funeral either. So, And how do you reflect, John? They are decent people, and this was one of the things that made it so hard to distance myself from them because, you know, they're moral. They're, they're generally very moral people. They've got high standards, and if the whole world was Jehovah's Witnesses, there would probably be a lot less crime and war, but comes at a big cost of personal freedom. John, Sarah and Terry, and we'd like to add that those allegations against Sarah's former partner have never been proven. In a statement, the religious group told us, if a baptised witness makes a practice of breaking the Bible's moral code and does not give evidence of stopping the practice, he or she will be shunned or disfellowshipped. When it comes to shunning, witnesses take their instructions from the Bible. And on this subject, the Bible clearly states, remove the wicked man from amongst yourselves. This email from Miles, who did the research for your article today. Jehovah's Witnesses don't disfellowship for separation from an abusive mate, and they don't disfellowship for someone not attending a memorial service. In fact, they provide support for ones who need help. Separation is a personal choice, and attending the memorial is a personal choice. Please check your facts before publishing lies. To balance out this mistake, can I suggest a full apology and an article which shows how loving and valuable to the community this group is. You can find plenty of material on jw.org. Email from Dawn. My whole family has been torn apart by Jehovah's Witnesses. We grew up scared. Scared of doing normal things like having friends or listening to music, dancing, having boyfriends, going to university, in case God judged us and would murder us at the end of the world. My parents actively shun my disfellowship sister to the point that they didn't attend weddings when she was there. My sister nearly died as a child as she was refused a blood transfusion when very ill. We have suffered the grief of losing our parents whilst they are still alive. We've struggled in adulthood to find careers and friendships as all of these things were considered worldly. It took years of counselling and bravery to come out of the cult and make a normal life. I'm so glad someone is now talking about this.
And one more for now, and there have been many of these emails. Sue says, I'm glad you're discussing this. I was brought up in the faith and quite honestly can say for children, it's the most ostracizing religion. I could never go to assembly, into assembly all my school life. I'd have to stand outside the hall. Apart from the no Christmas birthdays, Easter, Harvard Fest, uh, Harvest Festival, none of which I could join in. I would lie to other children and make up presents. Funnily enough, only last week I tried to explain to my mum, who's now 84, how it's affected me. She really does not understand, or maybe doesn't want to, as she still believes in this faith. And by the way, we decided to look into the issue after receiving an email from a viewer about her experience of being shunned. If you've got a story you'd like us to have a look at, do email me, victoria at bbc.co.uk.